Hi, everyone. So thank you so much for joining us. I know that um, more people will be walking into the room as we get started. And I just want to thank everyone for joining me on the day of my book launch. I'm Julie Sook. I'm the author of We the Women, the Unstoppable Mothers of the Equal Rights Amendment. And I was a little bit sad at first when I realized that I'd be launching my book in the middle of a pandemic and that I would not be able to have a live book party with um, see seeing everyone in person and um, hugging all of you and signing books. But uh, I had to take advantage of the situation we're in. And um, the fact that we were going to do this virtually meant that I could be joined by two really amazing women who have meant a lot to me over the decades, including Mariana Iskander, who's joining us from South Africa today. Mariana and I entered law school together 20 years ago in the year 2000, and she was my feminist rock. Uh, while we were in law school, she now lives in South Africa and runs this amazing organization that works on youth employment issues. Uh, and um, right after law school, she worked as the chief operating officer for Planned Parenthood uh, for a number of years. So I'm thrilled that she's joining this conversation. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say I would never have gotten to the point of writing this book had I not been talking about women and law with Mariana for so many years. Uh, we're also joined by Sarah Berliner today, my good friend uh, whom I've known since college. Uh, Sarah started this amazing social enterprise a few years ago called Vote Like a Mother. You can see Sarah's shirt that says Vote Like a Mother. Uh, and Sarah has been really active and we've had amazing conversations over the years about motherhood and parenthood as a lens for politics. And she started an organization to uh, try to help bring that issue uh, to the fore. And so I'm really thrilled that the two of them will be joining me in a conversation to launch We the Women. So I'm going to turn it over to Mariana. Thanks, Julie. I just want to check that you can hear me and it's all good before I just start talking. All good. Fantastic. So I first actually want to also acknowledge um, another connection that Julie and I have, which is the Paul and Daisy Soros um, Fellowship. It's a organization that really acknowledges and recognizes the contribution of immigrants to the story of America, probably um, needed now more than ever. And I want to thank the Paul and Daisy Soros Alumni Association for participating and helping co-sponsor this event. I think that um, Julie and I have many strands of history together, and that is another important one. I have um, the uh, delight of telling you more about um, my friend who, as Julie said, um, we've walked a journey over many decades talking about many things. In trying to think about how to tell you more about Julie's um, illustrious life, I thought we'll get all the fancy credentials, degrees, titles, and stuff out of the way and talk about the things that I really know Julie for and that I think this book really brings to life. Julie has um, achieved many things and participated um, in the work of many institutions. She's currently at the Graduate Center at CUNY, but prior to that was at Cardozo Law School. She has contributed to the scholarship and learning of law students at Harvard, at Yale, at Columbia, at Chicago, at UCLA. She is um, somebody whose academic interests have taken her um, out of the law and into, I think, very interesting intersections in the social sciences, and we'll hear a lot about that in the book. But what I really wanna talk about is I think Julie's courage and commitment um, and the journey that she's been on in writing this unbelievable book. It was, I, I read it actually all in one sitting um, and can't wait for more of you, I think to hear and learn the stories of these women that, that Julie has brought to us. And what I really wanted to say to you, Julie, is how proud I am, I think of really the courage that you have shown to the causes that you care about and I think the best way to introduce you is in the one sentence that you've used to introduce yourself. Um, you describe yourself as a mother striving to bend the arc of the moral universe. And for me, that is who you are and excited to start this conversation. 
Before uh, we actually hear more from Julie, I want to just hand over to Sarah. Thanks, Mariana. Um, thanks to everybody for joining us today. Um, I am just really thrilled to celebrate not just a book of enormous importance, and, and it is that, but really the work of a dear friend, a fellow working mom uh, whose advocacy, uh, it's very clear, has brought us closer to equal rights. And so um, I'm just overjoyed that and honored uh, to participate uh, and to help celebrate uh, bringing this book into the world. Um, so I'll just say, because I think all of you are gonna probably read this book. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about what's inside, but I'll give you my personal perspective, which is that it's honestly a revelation for me. I've always been aware of the long history of the struggle for equal rights in the US, um, the political community, and even for me, personal leaders uh, on whose shoulders I stand. We the women took me deep into the networks, the advocacy, the powerful leadership uh, that we've seen from women across generations really since America's founding. Um, and I found that for me it was so resonant, uh, a, a story with so many lessons and connections um, that I feel we need to mine uh, for our current struggle for equity. Um, and it's lessons not just for uh, gender equality and equity, um, but for all kinds, uh, racial and otherwise. Uh, from the struggle for suffrage to the early ERA that the suffragists envisioned and battled over, um, decades of scuffling in DC, uh, the influence of the Stop ERA movement, um, and recent state legislature battles in Illinois and Virginia. I really found that Julie's portraits of both the renowned people, the household names and the underrecognized founding mothers along the way um, really situated what we are working on today in this context uh, that to me just added additional weight and additional um, uh, impetus to, to take up this fight and to bring in the younger generations, because uh, I think as a Gen Xer, the ERA kind of flew past me as a footnote. Um, and what Julie's done, I think, is tell this story that is certainly learned, but also accessible. And I think we need to broadcast that story um, through people who are legislating today, through uh, future electeds, and through youth as well. So um, I'm really excited to talk, to get in deeper, to hear more from Julie, uh, have some additional um, context, and even to hear Julie from you a little bit about the process of writing You know, on a more personal level. I'd love to hear a bit about that. Julie's epilogue asks, what's next for the ERA? Why do we need it? And I think that Julie makes a compelling case for why we do need it, why it's an essential part of how we structure ourselves as a nation and what identities um, and opportunities are available to us. So thank you, Julie. Thank you for uh, writing this. Thank you for including me in this event. And um, let's let's get going. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. So Sarah and I are going to ask Julie a few questions just to get us started. But the chat is available. If you guys have comments, we will open up, um, I think, to, to others as well. So I'm just gonna get us started. I think what Sarah said that really is for me very profound, Julie, is it's it's a book that tells uh, a, a historical story so relevant for the time that we're in now and so relevant for the issues that we're trying to, to tackle. When you and I spoke last week, you said that one of the things about the book that really gives you a great source of pride is that some of the women are more known, but there are so many of these other stories to be told. And so I think with that as, as a backdrop, we are um, also in the midst of the cancel culture and uh, a reckoning of um, people's narratives. And I guess my, my question to you is, should Alice Paul be canceled? 
So thank you so much, Mariana. So Alice Paul is often credited uh, with having written and introduced the Equal Rights Amendment. She was a suffragist who really uh, was known for introducing some very militant tactics into the fight for women's right to vote. And, um, and when, when the 19th Amendment uh, suffrage was ratified, uh, she wanted another constitutional amendment right away. And that was the Equal Rights Amendment. And of course she wasn't acting alone. Um, she was with the National Women's Party, which she started. Um, so there were many women who were on board with the project of uh, introducing the ERA uh, in uh, 1923 when it was introduced. But I think one of the issues with Alice Paul uh, was that she was very single-minded in her approach, uh, both to suffrage and to the ERA. And sometimes it meant that the kinds of compromises she made to drive her agenda forward marginalized some of the other women who might have supported the movement and did in fact support the movement. Um, so uh, in, with regard to suffrage, this is a story because we're in the month of the suffrage centennial, um, a story that I think Americans are becoming more familiar with is uh, the way in which Alice Paul uh, really uh, was not comfortable with the full integration of African Americans into the 1913 suffrage parade uh, that she organized. And so African American women um, had to march in the back. Uh, and one of the African American women who did march with an African American sorority in the back, there was a wonderful story about this in the Washington Post uh, just yesterday, I think, uh, was Mary Church Terrell. And she was one of the founders of the National Association of Colored Women. Um, she was extremely cosmopolitan in her experience and outlook. She had traveled to Europe uh, since she was young and um, had been talking to suffragists in other countries in their languages uh, for, for many years. And she actually came out in support of the ERA uh, in the 1940s after many other women who um, Alice Paul uh, debated with in the 20s um, had sort of been on the fence about the ERA because they were afraid that the ERA might be interpreted in ways that would disadvantage working class women. So I think now that we're getting a fuller picture of Alice Paul, uh, I, today we might say she should be canceled because she's not the hero uh, that we all thought she was. But I think that the truth about everyone, whether they're founding mothers of the constitution or founding fathers of the constitution, is that they're human beings who live in a particular time and struggle uh, with the po what's possible. Uh, and many of them work to stretch what's possible. Uh, and that's what politics and constitution making uh, is about. And I have deep admiration for Alice Paul because without her persistence, I don't think that suffrage would have moved as quickly as it did. And I don't think that the ERA uh, even though it also caused controversy, I don't think that the ERA would have really been put on the map at the moment that it was uh, without her. Uh, and I think maybe this is a way of saying that um, nobody should be canceled uh, because everybody's human. Um, so Julie, I will be totally honest and say, I didn't know about the anti-ERA sentiment that came from would-be supporters. You know, I didn't know enough about the movement to understand uh, objections related to special protections for mothers, um, for this, this idea that um, if you offer special protect protections, for, for um, women, especially in relating to, to childbearing, that you were gonna then have to extend those protections to other people and no one would buy that. I mean, this was the intrigue around that, uh, totally fascinating. I'd love for you to just, I think probably there are other people on this, this, uh, at this event who don't have that context and how that contributed to a lot of the machinations Mm -hmm. um, and sort of the uh, um, particular in the early years. Yeah, absolutely. So one thing that's not necessarily known about the ERA was that when it was introduced uh, in 1923, uh, not all the women's groups, even the women's groups who united and got suffrage passed, not all of them supported the ERA. Uh, and it was because uh, the re their reasons for not supporting it uh, are really important in light of what happens later. Uh, they were afraid that the Equal Rights Amendment would be interpreted 
to require rigid sex blindness. And they were very aware of who was going to be doing the interpreting. Uh, and that is the nine men on the Supreme Court uh, in 1923. And it was still nine men uh, by the time you got to 1972. And at the time, the Supreme Court had actually been using uh, our other source of equality, uh, the 14th Amendment, which guarantees both equal protection of the laws and due process of the law uh, passed after the Civil War. The Supreme Court was using that to strike down any kind of labor protection for anybody, right? So, uh, but then there was this blip in 1908 in a case called Mueller versus Oregon, in which the Supreme Court said, boy, women can't even vote, so they can't protect themselves uh, against labor exploitation. And therefore, we're going to protect women because they actually don't have <laughs> all of the ability, the freedoms uh, that would enable them to protect themselves under the 14th Amendment. So there was this exception for women created. Uh, and because of that, uh, some of the women who were really interested in making sure that working mothers and women in general had certain labor protections like limitations on the hours of work uh, and minimum wages for women, uh, they were really afraid that the judges interpreting the ERA would use the ERA as an opportunity uh, to strike away uh, those labor protections. And I don't think, I mean, I think given that that was the court that we had and didn't change until the New Deal, until the late 1930s, I don't think that those fears were unreasonable. Women like Florence Kelly, they actually wanted other amendments that were structured differently. They wanted a child labor amendment, for example. And the, even on, um, with regard to labor rights for women and for everyone, they would have preferred an amendment that said, Congress has the power uh, to impose minimum wages and to regulate labor, right? Uh, that, that they, they might have preferred a different kind of amendment that cleared the way for progressive legislation instead of something that was just kind of abstract that a judge could use uh, to strike down labor protections. And that was sort of what was happening in the 1920s. So in 1923, for example, the Supreme Court did actually strike down the women's minimum wage in a case called Atkins uh, versus Children's Hospital. And Florence Kelly, uh, one of the reformers uh, who I profiled in the book said, if you use um, the the 14th Amendment and the Fifth Amendment, uh, which is, uh, also guarantees equal protection and due process, if you use these amendments to strike down a women's minimum wage, that's basically protecting a woman's constitutional right to starve. Uh, and we don't want that, you know? And, um, and so it was really in that context. And Atkins is so interesting because in 1923, the Supreme Court says, oh, women don't need protections labor protections anymore because look at the 19th Amendment. The 19th Amendment proves that now uh, inequality is going out the door. Uh, it's vanishing. Uh, and of course, that wasn't the reality on the ground, especially for women working in factories and laundries. Uh, and women's wages actually plummeted after that decision. So I think in the context of what was actually happening on the ground, um, the, the, the women who objected to the ERA in the 20s shouldn't really be think, thought of as stoppers. I think you could think of as productive postponers. Um, they were making dissenting arguments that actually reshaped what the ERA became by the time it was passed. And it was by the time we got to the 70s, it was a much better ERA for that reason. Uh, and, and I think it's also important that there are other stories um, we can tell about women who continue to dissent. Even someone like Phyllis Schlafly, I think proved uh, that if you didn't pay attention to the needs of mothers, um, it was going to be very easy to sink the amendment. Uh, and I think it is important then for the pro ERA side um, to have a discourse about motherhood and motherhood as a lens for politics uh, as a justification for equality. So one of the women, Julie, that I um, learned about in reading the book was Congresswoman Mary Griffiths. And um, at one point, she says, um, and those of you who've just joined, I see we've had more people buy this book. It is incredible and, um, and, and, and important. So Mary Griffiths says at one point, you know, the battle wasn't so much between the pro ERA and anti ERA, she says the battle is with the Supreme Court. And 
I think building off the reflection that you've just had, if we think about the moment we're in now and who is who gets to be in the business of constitution making and, and understanding what your reflections are about that as it, as it is in the kind of historical record of the ERA, but I think really relevant to the moment that we're in now as a, as a country and as a society. Great, so Congresswoman Martha Griffiths was just really politically savvy. And she's the one 50 years ago yesterday, August 10th, 1970, uh, she really did this incredible thing. There were these guys on the House Judiciary Committee who just would not let the ERA get debated by the whole House. Uh, they kept it bottled up in committee for like over a decade. And Martha Griffith spent the summer of 1970 doing a discharge petition, which means you collect the signatures of half of the House she cornered these people and got their signatures. And that meant that the ERA could actually be debated by the whole body instead of just the handful of men who are on the House Judiciary Committee. And once the whole body debated it, uh, like well over 90% voted for it. So that, that said, but what's really the content of what she said, why do we need an ERA? She said, this is actually a battle with the Supreme Court because you know, for all those people saying we don't need an ERA because we have the 14th Amendment, uh, I would say, she and she, she said, I would say the Supreme Court hasn't taken us there yet. The Supreme Court has not to this date uh, interpreted the 14th Amendment uh, to strike down discrimination against women. And what's really interesting about that move is that she's now invoking a very different vision of the ERA than the way that we normally think about constitutional rights even today. And it's a vision that was advanced on the floor also by Patsy Takamoto Mink, who was the first non-white woman elected to Congress in 1964. She was Japanese American uh, and uh, lived through the internment of Japanese Americans uh, during World War II. Uh, and Shirley Chisholm, the first African American woman elected to Congress uh, shortly after Patsy Mink, the two of them really argued that the ERA was not going to be about the Supreme Court being in charge of equality. Uh, the ERA was going to be about Congress and the state legislatures uh, legislating to make equality real for women. So at the same time that they were really pushing forward the ERA, they were pushing forward childcare legislation uh, on the floor of the house and gathering political support for that. Uh, Patsy Mink was the mother of Title IX, um, which is probably the most important law now uh, with regard to education uh, and e equal opportunity, real equality of opportunity in education. So their vision for the ERA was not just hand it over to the Supreme Court and let them decide what it means. It was once you have it, you have the political momentum and the legitimacy to do everything else you need to do to make equality real for women. And I think that vision really holds today because honestly, we don't know if we get an ERA, we don't know how the Roberts Court is going to interpret it. Uh, and so the vision of the ERA that I think uh, was advanced in the 70s. And also there's a through line to the women who led the efforts to ratify in uh, Nevada, Illinois, and Virginia in recent years. Uh, it's really not just about judges saying what it means. It's also about women using it as a foundation, women lawmakers and those who support them, uh, women and men who are interested in gender equality and gender justice, using the ERA as a foundation from which uh, all the public policies and the nitty gritty work gets done. So speaking of the nitty gritty work and, and those three state legislatures, I wondered if you could take us a little bit into the minds and the work of the Virginia process and the, the moms um, and particularly the moms of color who were real leaders and, and sort of have taken the, the view um, that the ERA is an extension of what we now would call an intersectional uh, movement. Um, and, and tell us a little bit more about that because um, you know those of us that worked on flipping Virginia in the state legislature, the idea that um, that very direct action led to something like this and, and sort of reopening the doors to the ERA um, as a national movement, you know, is uh, that's very exciting. Great, thank you so much for that question. Well, the Virginia story um, is a really important one, obviously, uh, because uh, and it, but it's similar to what happens in the two other states as well. 
in that the women who are leading the efforts to ratify just decades after uh, the ERA was adopted by Congress, uh, these are women of color who have been elected to the state legislatures. Uh, and in Virginia, there, there were very many, but two leading figures were Jennifer McClellan uh, in the Virginia Senate and Jennifer Carol Foy in the Virginia House of Delegates. And, um, and both of them have this amazing story. So Jennifer McClellan was actually the first woman to give birth while in office in the House of Delegates. Uh, and that was, um, I, I would say, a, a decade ago. Uh, I think her son just celebrated his birthday uh, a few days ago, uh, if I'm correct. So she gave birth. And what was amazing is that while she was pregnant, some people asked her, um, are, you're not running for re-election, are you? And she just thought, why wouldn't I? And why is nobody asking my male colleagues whose wives are pregnant, who are also about to become very busy uh, raising children? And I think that is actually a fundamental question about the story of women in constitutional change uh, because, uh, and it's connected to the story of women's underrepresentation in politics. I mean, the Congress that adopted the ERA in 1970 to 72 was like 2% women. Uh, and um, even now um, we're excited about the fact that Congress is at an all time high, it's 23.7%, which is, you know, it's progress, it's 10 times as many, as many women in percentages uh, since the 70s, but it's still so few women that if you're looking at the constitution, uh, you need two thirds of both houses of Congress to adopt a constitutional amendment. Uh, and while it turns out, not only if you're at 23%, that's far less than two thirds. And in fact, it's even less than one third, which is what you need to block a constitutional amendment. Um, so it's there's severe underrepresentation. I think a lot of it has to do with assumptions about how motherhood impacts uh, a person's ability to participate in politics and to certainly to be a leader uh, in politics. So I think it's very exciting. Jennifer Carol Foy in the House of Delegates was also pregnant while she was campaigning for the House of Delegates. Uh, and her story is pretty amazing as well because she was one of the first women and African-American women um, to graduate from the Virginia Military Institute, VMI. Uh, which actually was all male until 1996. And the only reason it started admitting women is that the Supreme Court said it had to in a landmark decision authored by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, in 1996. So, um, so when you take that story and all that history and now women in increasing numbers in the state legislature are saying now it's time, it's time for the ERA and it's taken a really long time um, but we still think it's important uh, and we're going to uh, do it uh, to enshrine uh, in our fundamental documents uh, that uh, set up our political order, that women are constitution makers too, uh, women are equal participants in politics. Uh, and one way in which we do that is by simply stating in the constitution uh, that women have equal rights or rather that equal rights can't be denied uh, or abridged uh, on account of sex, which is what the ERA actually says. Uh, so I, and I think that you see that um, in the other states as well. In Nevada, it's Senator Spearman, uh, Pat Spearman, uh, who's an African-American woman who served in the military uh, and worked to fight against Don't Ask, Don't Tell, who really uh, instigates uh, the Nevada uh, legislative resurrection of the ERA in 2017. Uh, and then in Illinois, uh, there are many African-American legislators uh, who are involved uh, in both houses uh, in getting the ERA ratification resolution. And these stories are also important, especially, I mean, in Virginia in particular, what's really amazing about the story is that Virginia didn't ratify in the 1970s. Virginia, by the way, also didn't ratify the 19th Amendment until 30 years after women had been voting. Uh, and, and I think the Virginia story also shows, like if you look at why it took so long, in Virginia, it was mostly men in these small committees, the Privileges and Elections Committee, uh, that actually bottled up the ERA and kept the whole body from actually debating and voting on the ratification resolution. And this is one part of the constitutional amendment process that I think we don't really think about. And I don't recall uh, 
Mariana can probably attest that this is not something we talked about when we were in law school. And I don't know how much it's talked about in law school today. Uh, but I think one thing that's true is that state legislatures, uh, even after an overwhelming majority of Congress decides to adopt an amendment, the states can decide whether to ratify it or not on their own terms. Uh, the states can decide um, not to even put it up for a vote. <laughs> they can keep it in committee. Uh, the states can decide. And in Illinois, this is why it wasn't ratified in the 1970s. In Illinois, the states decided, the state legislature decided that they were going to have a 60% rule. Uh, you needed 60% of the votes in the state legislature uh, to ratify a federal constitutional amendment. In most other states, you can ratify an amendment with just 51% of the vote. Uh, but in Illinois, they decided to impose a higher bar. Uh, and these are the kinds of things that really stopped it. Uh, and it's directly related to this uh, underrepresentation problem. Like if you start uh, adopting like super majority or higher bars or giving all this power to small committees that are staffed mostly by the most senior men, uh, it's a way of holding things up for a very long time. Well, Julie, that's um, maybe one of the reasons the final part of the book is called Persistence. And it <laughs> seems to me, it seems to me that one of the most powerful gifts of this book is that it arms us with the history and the stories to be ready, I think, for what's next. And so I wondered if you could talk us through what's next, the, the kind of contestation over the deadline how those of us who want to do more than just read the book, but engage and be involved, you know, what, what can we do now in 2020 to take this forward? So great. Well, I think the question of what's next is a really important one now. Uh, after Virginia ratified, so Virginia became the 38th state, and that makes th three fourths of the states, which is what Article 5 of the Constitution requires. But um, as we've mentioned, when Congress actually finally adopted uh, the amendment in 1972, uh, they uh, had a seven year time limit on ratification that was put into the resolution introducing the ERA. And because there was a seven year time limit uh, in 1978, uh, Congress actually extended that time limit once uh, to 1982, they voted to do that. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the ERA came three, short, three states short uh, in 1979 when the original time limit expired and, um, and no, no additional states ratified before the extended time limit in 1982, uh, but the three states that we needed to get to 38 ratified in 2017, 2018, and 2020. So basically they came in late under that deadline. And now the question is, um, does the deadline have to be enforced? <laughs> and who decides what happens? And I think there's a lot of disagreement with regard to strategy uh, about those questions, but I'll just tell you uh, what I think. Uh, and, um, and a lot of it is driven by my understanding of the history uh, and the precedents around this. So I think that um, Article 5 actually doesn't say anything about deadlines. So there is this question as to whether or not um, it's deadlines on ratification are a normal part of the constitution amendment process. Uh, Article five doesn't say anything about it, but Congress has been using them uh, in proposing constitutional amendments pretty much for all the amendments that have succeeded since uh, the prohibition amendment in 1917, well, when Congress voted on it in 1917. So it's become this routine part of the constitutional amendment process uh, and it's not actually in the text of the amendment. Congress started putting it in the resolution introducing the amendment in, um, in the later, in the middle part of the 20th century, but did that with the 23rd, 24th, 25th, and 26th amendments, right? So one question is, um, maybe it's not uh, required that the deadline be observed. Uh, and that was certainly the understanding when, again, led by women like Liz Holtzman, uh, in Congress in 1978. Um, I have a chapter in the book called The Game Changers about the women who led the deadline uh, extension. Uh, it seems that uh, when the deadline was extended, one understanding was that because it was in the resolution, Congress had the power to extend it. 
Uh, and that philosophy is very much alive now. Uh, Congress has the power to just remove the deadline altogether. And the House actually voted to do that this year. Uh, but right now in the Senate, there are 48 co-sponsors uh, and Mitch McConnell is personally not a fan of the ERA. Uh, so it doesn't look like it's going to move in the Senate, at least in this term. Uh, but voters uh, have the opportunity to vote for candidates who support the ERA for both houses of Congress coming this coming November. Uh, and I do think that is probably the route uh, that is most likely to legitimize the ERA, just to vote in both houses of Congress uh, to remove the deadline. And I think Supreme Court precedents and the history of the deadline extension really support uh, that move. And, um, and I think even if that happens, uh, there will still be people who say it's too late, it's too late, it's too late. Uh, but I do think that if both houses of Congress remove the deadline, um, it will be something that the courts will respect. So last question, and then we're going to open it up. Um, you could probably guess that, you know, my mind goes toward what can we do, right? What is, what's the action that we can all walk away with from, you know, uh, an important um, history and, and um, uh, discussion around, you know, history as it's being made, right? So how can we support it? I mean, looking back at um, understanding more about the women's strike for equality with baby inns, you know, in the street uh, with, uh, you know, these incredible women, um, obviously electing women and ensuring representation so that um, the sort of trickery of tiny committees, you know, full of old white men and, uh, you know, filibustering and things that, that uh, keep the will of the people from being enacted. Obviously electing women is a, is a long-term goal um, and an urgent one. What are some other things that we could do to support specifically passing, um, you know, uh, uh, bringing it back to um, uh, the House and the Senate to push that forward? You know, is it really about, um, you know, helping advocates that are working on that right now um, and sort of just making it something that's part of more a part of everyday conversation in terms of recognizing the ERA? Um, t tell us, tell us what we can do, Julie. Great. So I think that in the immediate near future, a lot of it will have to do with elections. Uh, that is, if uh, if people support uh, the path to adding the ERA, uh, that seems to be the most likely right now, uh, then uh, they should really pay attention uh, to the Senate. Uh, and they should make sure that the majority that voted to, ex to remove the deadline uh, in February of this year in the House uh, is uh, preserved, right? And you know, some of the, those who voted to extend the deadline are also up for reelection and we should make sure that <laughs> those folks are reelected. Uh, and then in the Senate, I think, uh, so I think immediately just in 2020, um, it can be an election issue with regard to the composition of the Congress. Uh, but I think uh, in, I kind of wrote the book with a longer history and longer uh, future in mind. And I think one of the big questions is that, um, I mean, what does it say about our constitution uh, and about the United States as a nation? Uh, most countries in the world since World War II have had provisions guaranteeing equal rights regardless of sex, equal rights between women and men. It's a very common feature uh, of every constitution. Uh, the United States has tried but failed again and again to get such a provision. Uh, does that mean, and I'm, I'm saddened by the fact that I think the dominant narrative, and it's a dominant narrative that was put in the TV show, Mrs. America, is women failed to get an ERA because women didn't want it. Uh, mothers and housewives fight, fought against feminists, but it's because women didn't want it and that's why we don't have it. And I don't think that's true. Uh, I think that we don't have it because the process of constitutional change in this country enshrined in Article 5 and then practiced by Congress with the use of deadlines uh, and other maneuvers in Congress and state legislatures have made the ERA fail for generations. 
And we should not be putting the spotlight on women fighting each other about the amendment. We should be putting the spotlight on the channels of constitutional change, what's written in Article 5 that might also need to be uh, reconsidered, uh, and what's not written in Article 5, uh, the committee system and deadlines uh, that we can change without even amending the Constitution. And I think part of it is it goes back to what are how we teach the Constitution, uh, not only to law students, but to high school students and middle schoolers, um, how we teach the students about the founding fathers who were uh, brilliant, uh, but flawed. Um, they haven't been canceled and nor should they be. Uh, but I do think that we need to think about the institutions that they created um, as they benefited from uh, women and African-Americans not having rights and supporting the work that they did uh, in many respects. Uh, and I think once we start thinking about both the founding fathers and the process of constitutional change differently, uh, we might be in a position uh, to think not only about this ERA, but other constitutional changes that are needed to bring this country into the 21st century. Uh, constitutional changes around things like the right to vote, not just the right to vote not denied on, on account of sex, but seriously, like the real right to vote, uh, or the electoral college. Uh, is that something that we would like to continue to have? Uh, these are all things that can and perhaps should change in the constitution, but we are not, we don't exist in a constitutional culture in which we question the process of constitutional change. And I think one thing that these women did over the uh, hundred years is draw attention to that process and what kinds of changes were made easy by that process and what kinds of changes were made nearly impossible by that process. There's so much there to unpack, Julie. So I know Sarah and I both still have lots more questions, but we thought we'd stop and um, be guided by you if you want people to raise their hands or jump in, or how do you want to manage uh, opening it up? So I'd love to see everyone, <laughs> and because I see a, a whole bunch of names. Uh, and so, yeah, I would love people to just jump in if they can. Uh, or uh, if it gets disorderly, I guess, uh, maybe we could have people raise their hands. <sighs> I see Pat Spearman in the room. Thanks so much for joining us, Pat. Pat is one of the heroes of Nevada ratification, uh, whose story I tell in chapter 10 of the book. So thank you so much for, for being here with us. Uh, I'd love to take questions or comments or really anything from, from people who have taking the time to join. So, uh, Julie, can I just say something real quick? Um, what you said about looking at the people who voted uh, to remove the deadline and those who did not, that's very important in this upcoming election. Uh, in 2015, many of you know that I carried the bill to ratify the ERA and my party was not in control of either house and it failed. And 2016, I was up for re-election and that's what I ran on. I ran on re-elect me so that I can carry the ball across the finish line to get the ERA ratified. And so for those of you who are in states where you have people who have dug their heels in and just you know flat out refuse to acknowledge that we do have the right uh, and those rights should be enshrined in the constitution, they should go home, they should go home. And those who are supporting our equality are the ones that we should be sending to Washington. Anyone who does not believe in full equality has no right whatsoever to be representing anybody uh, on Capitol Hill. So remember that, and that's not just at the federal level, but that's at the state level too. So you, you brought a very good point. Uh, we can make changes just like that and make people believe that we're serious when we say, equality under the law shall not be denied or abridged and we'll prove it with our vote. Thank you so much, Pat. Thank you. Julie, I see two hands are up. I just wanted to flag that for you. Yeah, can we go to Lisa? Lisa Sales, thank you so much for joining Lisa. She's also been uh, behind the scenes working in Virginia for a lot of the changes that I talk about in the book. Hey, oh, thank you, Julie. Hi, Pat. Hi, Carol. I see lots of faces. Hi, Kavi. Um, so wonderful to see everyone here. Congratulations on your book. Mine is being delivered, Amazon says, tomorrow. I'm just, uh, uh, want your signature. 
<laughs> um, so I put in the chat, I was trying to hide. I, uh, I, I put in the chat, do you think if we get more women elected to Congress and to state houses, there would be less resistance overall to changing the very constitution, and not just for the ERA, but the other things you spoke of, like the electoral college and et cetera? So I think it's, it's a hard question to answer because I don't want to give the impression that every woman who has been elected supports the ERA uh, and support, supports progressive uh, positions. Uh, I think it's kind of complicated. Uh, but that said, uh, I do think that um, thinking about why women have been underrepresented uh, has a lot to do first with their formal exclusion <laughs> Uh, because of their role in childbearing and childbearing, and then because of the difficulties uh, of uh, making a career, including a career in politics, when there's so little support for childcare uh, and childbearing uh, by our institutions and by government. And I think that's actually an issue that's really uh, heating up uh, because of uh, the ways in which the current pandemic uh, has laid bare uh, the, the problem of caregiving and working and being a full participant. Uh, and so, and I think that's actually something that's real uh, for all people. And right now, the way that society uh, is structured uh, culturally and otherwise, uh, a lot of the burden does often fall on women and on, on mothers. Uh, so, I, and I think because of that, because of that within our culture, um, it's, it is possible that having more women in general uh, in leadership positions will just as a practical matter, uh, draw more attention to those, that set of issues. Uh, and it's a set of issues that, I, that, are, that re require a whole bunch of changes in public policy uh, and um, some of which uh, connect up to constitutional changes. Uh, so I think, uh, yes, but not, di like, not in like a kind of bullet direct way. Uh, but yes, I do think that it, it will create more of an openness to change in the future. So, Junie, can yes. I ask a question? Yes, of course. Penny. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I've got, I'm ordering your book on Amazon and I'll make sure that our law library also gets a copy. So I'm really looking forward to reading it. Thank you so much, Penny. It's great to see you. Thank you. I'm, I'm sort of thinking you, you mentioned that in your last comment that constitutional change uh, requires sort of policy change. I'm sort of thinking of, you know, something deeper. Constitutional change does require uh, policy change, but also deep cultural change. And I'm sort of comparing this you know, the, 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 having a gender equality provision as a constitutional amendment is key. But I think about a place like South Africa, where there was a marrying of a constitutional sort of deeply embedded sort of norms about equality in the constitution, a very, very amenable constitutional court. And still, and, and one third of the first uh, uh, government having female politicians, and that has really not moved the ball much in 25 years in South Africa where you had all of that. So I'm really interested in once you get beyond representation, the law, there's something else that needs to happen. And I think the cultural change is important. I just saw an article, I won't belabor the point, I saw an article comparing Black Lives Matter and um, hashtag me too. And the article seemed to suggest that there's already such a strong bash, backlash against Me Too and that many women aren't on board. So, uh, so I, I think that the legal bits and the representational bits and all the formal parts are very important, but there has to be a shift, a deep cultural shift. And from my experience in South Africa, it's that cultural, the resistance that's not allowed the constitutional promise to really take full effect. Yeah. I. Uh, thank you so much for the comparative insight. Uh, I do think that one of, one of the issues I think that comes up is that uh, we tend to want to believe that getting an ERA or any other constitutional change will be sufficient to bring about the, the real change and the real freedom uh, that we're seeking. But in fact, uh, it's not sufficient. It's only the beginning. 
And that's actually something Crystal Eastman said. She was one of the founders of what became the ACLU and a suffragist who worked with Alice Paul in drafting the ERA, uh, and also a figure in uh, one of the early chapters of my book. Crystal Eastman said when women got the vote, this is only the beginning, right? Uh, and there was all this other stuff that had to happen. And I think the ERA uh, is also another beginning. Uh, and uh, the constitutional amendments, even the ones that I mentioned that might be good ideas, like having a real right to vote or an electoral college shift, uh, all of these things are only the beginning. Um, I think you're absolutely right uh, that that beginning uh, would feed a cultural change, but the cultural change doesn't happen automatically. Um, there's a lot of heavy lifting that has to be done in the way that we teach uh, children, not only about the constitution, uh, but about institutions uh, and the social conditions of equality. So thank you, Julie. Alice, so great to see you, Alice. Thank you so Hi. much for joining. How are you? <laughs> Um, I, I was struck by one of the things you said, and I was late joining, so I apologize for that. But I was struck by the comment you made about the fact that the, over the last hundred years, it was not just a question of what had been changed, but the role that women had played in rethinking how the Constitution might be changed. And it occurred to me that that relates uh, directly to the so-called originalist interpretations mm -hmm. that we now see. And I'm wondering if you want to make a link between the way originalism sort of rose in the wake of the defeat or the, re you know, the rejection or the non-ratification of the ERA to um, uh, you know, the, the way in which women who struggled for the ERA uh, were really confronted by this originalist interpretation and how that has really undermined us in the past 20, 30 years. So thank you so much, Alice. Uh, it's a really challenging question because on the one hand, um, I think one of the difficulties posed by the current revival of the ERA is uh, this genuine question as to what does an amendment mean if it's drafted in one generation, adopted by Congress in another generation, and then ratified by additional states in another generation, and then projecting into the future will continue to be interpreted by legislatures and judges uh, in future generations, right? And I think, and one of the things that I'm trying to do in the book is to show that women, um, I mean, as the struggle continued, uh, every time there was a measure of success, the women who started it were actually dead. Um, as you know, with suffrage, uh, the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, the 19th Amendment, well, Susan B. Anthony was dead by the time we got that. And many of the women who were in Congress in the early 1970s who adopted the ERA are no longer uh, with us. Uh, and so there's this kind of building of transgenerational meaning. Uh, but I think there is an element of originalism because I don't think that the ERA, if we were resurrecting an ERA based only on its meaning in 1970 uh, or 1972, it may not be an ERA that's well equipped to deal with some of the reasons why uh, women are still interested in having an amendment today. Issues raised by the Me Too movement um, inclusive LGBTQ uh, rights. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I do think that it's because of this process by which um, the state legislatures uh, have debated about why it's still needed uh, and connected it to the past uh, that gives it its meaning. Uh, but I, I, in some ways it's just still kind of originalist because I'm coming back to uh, what uh, the public meaning is as created and led uh, by the lawmakers at these different historical moments and then seeing if we can create um, a democratic um, consensus across generations rather than a democratic consensus and meaning synchronously, uh, which is the traditional model uh, of uh, meaning making. Thank you. Reva. Hi, Hi Reva. Oh. Can you unmute? 
Rifa, can you unmute? I believe Darren had a question first. Actually, Darren is first, and then I want to engage that. Okay, with I'm sorry, I didn't look in the chat box. Sorry, sorry. No worries. Um, Julie, Hi, Darren. Hi. Um, it's um, so exciting to see this project come to fruition, and I really can't wait to read it myself. Um, and Thank you. and actually, your answer to Alice's question leads up to mine because I think that generational question is such an exciting one um, because there's obviously a way in which the ERA effort um, really could lay the groundwork for inclusion of people of all sexes, including transgender and non-binary people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I think it is. it would be a really interesting sort of cross-generational um, engagement, which hopefully we'll get the chance to do once the Senate um, um, authorizes the amendment to um, count. Um, but I guess the question that I had was actually related to what I see as the big resistance. So Gloria Steinem and Ellie Smeal posted uh, a piece recently criticizing Mrs. America, um, talking about how the insurance industry was really at fault and that it wasn't that women didn't succeed in passing the ERA. And I thought that was an interesting intervention, but for me, the more interesting intervention is to focus on the complexity of masculinity and of men around the ERA and how they played a role in, in maintaining their own power, excluding women from obtaining this tool that could have led to greater equality and inclusion and, and into positions where they could threaten men's um, uh, you know, monopoly over um, corporate and political power. Um, and so I was just wondering whether um, uh, when I pick up your book, if there's anything in there about those um, hidden stories, because of course, behind all of these mothers who you describe, there are men who presumably um, or, or not men, right, uh, who are presumably supporting them, but there's also this whole sort of background of opposition and tension, um, given that the power system in our country then and today is in the hands of men. So any, any thoughts on, on those points? Yeah, absolutely. So I just had a piece in Sunday's LA Times about how then as now, uh, the ERA is in the hands of men, not women. Uh, that is, of course, Phyllis Schlafly played a role in defeating right. the ERA, but in some ways the game was already uh, set up uh, by men in Congress. Um, I mentioned earlier that when the ERA first passed the House by over 90% of the vote, it had no ratification deadline. Uh, that was uh, in the month of the 50th anniversary of women's suffrage. And once the House passed it, the Senate could have said, it's the 50th anniversary of women's suffrage, let's get an ERA. But they did not do that. Uh, the Senate said, what about a deadline? <laughs> and, and it wasn't the Senate, by the way. By the time the Senate actually voted on it, only eight guys voted against it, 84 votes in favor in 1972. But when it moved to the Senate in 1970, uh, a small number of men said, don't we need to have a deadline on this? And um, maybe we should also have a provision about the military draft. And maybe we should also throw in school prayer and other things, right? So they made all these changes to the ERA, which was actually a subtle way of killing it uh, without actually taking responsibility for opposing women's rights. Uh, so the ERA goes to the legislative graveyard, the one that had no deadline. Uh, and because of this maneuvering by powerful men in the Senate, uh, when Martha Griffiths comes back in 1971 to reintroduce the ERA, she says, you know what, let's just put the deadline in there uh, to quiet some of the critics. Uh, but the fact that so many men, if you look at the record also, there were men who voted for the ERA in the Senate, even though they might have preferred some amendments, they might have preferred a different language, but they voted for it. Uh, and that suggests to me that they might have voted for it even without the deadline. Uh, but lo and behold, the one that we got in 1972 had that deadline in it. And the deadline, um, one of the fiercest opponents of the ERA in the Senate, uh, Sam Irvin, said, uh, he said, time is going to be my weapon and friend. 
Uh, and he started calling his friends in state legislatures, particularly in North Carolina, where he was from. Uh, and uh, there, uh, the, the strategy uh, in uh, state legislatures was uh, men holding it in committee uh, as the ratification clock was ticking. That, was, uh, that is what happened in Virginia. Uh, and seven years is actually a short time uh, if that happens. Uh, and so that's the game. And of course, uh, the fact that there's also a culture war around mothers and wives led by Phyllis Schlafly uh, plays a role. Uh, and I don't want to downplay uh, the role. Uh, I, I don't necessarily, I mean, I, I think Gloria uh, Steinem and Ellie Smeal are right that there are all these other forces at work other than Phyllis Schlafly, but Phyllis Schlafly also plays a role. But I think it is important. What I would like to do is shift the spotlight onto the way in which um, men, uh, even when they don't represent the majority, or the people's will um, have used their discretion and used their power uh, to stop this thing uh, that has become a feature of constitution throughout the world, as you know, uh, Darren, as comparativist, uh, and to stop this thing that was had growing popular support, uh, both amongst women and men uh, during this period. Thanks so much, Julie. I look. I'll, yeah. I'm reading the op-ed now. I just posted it for everybody else to read. I just got back from break, so I haven't gotten a chance. Oh, no, but, no but as always, when we meet, we have, we have a lot of similar thoughts. So I'm excited about this project. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Darren. So did we have time for Riva? Um, Thanks I, for joining, Riva. OK, so I didn't expect to um, take off my screen, but the comments about originalism provoked me. So I apologize for not being appropriately dressed. I was actually trying to write something with Julie. So I was keeping my screen down. Um, I'll just be really quick. I want to, um, first of all, say that I'm a massive fan of the book and in part for a reason that hasn't been, we've talked about, but we haven't fully, I think, identified methodologically um, as in dialogue with this whole conversation about originalism, which is that it's showcasing all of these wonderful constitution makers who are women, who happen to be women. And when we talk about the people who make constitutions, they're never women. I mean, if you just think about the way we talk about the constitution, it just so happens that they're just never women. And a feature of this book is that it happens to be populated by all these women who are busy talking about issues of constitutional meaning. And what I wanna say as my second point is, we can really focus on the importance of that without then fully embracing originalism as the method by which they become authoritative in our tradition. We, I am looking at the time, so I'm just going to be respectful of everybody's time and say that even the conservatives on the court um, cheat, or claim to be originalists, cheat when they elevate people that they want to treat as um, authoritative forefathers and do the thing that my students laugh at when I call filial piety. You know, Frederick <laughs> Douglass. They don't worry about whether they had the vote, you know. Thomas does not worry about whether Douglas had the vote when he starts quoting Frederick Douglass. He's just an important American. And so, and if we want to worry about giving Crystal Eastman her due, we're not going to figure out where she fits in the ERA's history. So we can't sign on to a positive law theory about originalism and all the, you know, the terms of that debate or we should think long and hard if we want to before we go that route. And I would say the same about textualism and plastic, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> um, that's the Title VII case that was just decided. So I'm simply gonna say that um, there are many, many, many steps to go down before we decide how we would interpret an ERA or how we'd relate it to our existing jurisprudence under the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause but a first massive, really gorgeous contribution of this book is to remind us that telling stories of women before and after the ratification of the Reconstruction Amendments, whether they had the vote or di were disfranchised, elevating their stories and treating them with dignity and consequence is a really critical contribution 
to our current constitutional struggle. I really think that that's key and it will make a difference in the way we understand the Equal Protection Clause, the 15th Amendment, uh, the 19th Amendment, and any ERA unratified or ratified. So I'll just stop it there. And again, apologies for my dress and my time and my getting in Darren's way. No, absolutely. Reva, thank you so much for that intervention. Uh, I do want to recognize that Reva Siegel and Alice Kessler Harris are, in many respects, the intellectual godmothers uh, of what's in this book. So, uh, so and I'm so uh, appreciative of both of you for being here and contributing to this conversation. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to reading the book, Julie. It sounds wonderful. <laughs> thank you, Alice. So I see that we've actually, I've, I've kept you longer than I said I would. Uh, so I just wanna thank all of you for joining. It's been so heartening uh, to see all of you on the screen uh, and, uh, and also to uh, hear all of your comments and questions. I'm especially thrilled uh, that Pat Spearman, uh, who is a character uh, in the book, uh, showed up. Uh, it means a lot to me, Pat. Uh, and, um, and I'm uh, thrilled to have all of your support and readership. Uh, Riva and I will be uh, doing another event for the American Constitution Society about the legacy of the 19th Amendment on August 26th. So keep your eyes out uh, for that event. It'll be a virtual event. Uh, August 26th is of course the day that the 19th Amendment was officially added uh, to the Constitution in 1920. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much, Mariana and thank Sarah. You. Thank you so much to Paul and Daisy Soros Fellows Association and Vote Like a Mother uh, and Merrill Moss and Book Trib for making this possible. Uh, it's been a wonderful launch event and I look forward to continuing the conversation with all of you.